Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So we're going to be looking at F. Scott Fitzgerald as the next author in our series of authors who we're examining. And F. Scott Fitzgerald is a, an interesting character. Um, we'll we'll sort of get into some details of his life later. If you read The Great Gatsby, um, which many people do in high school and sometimes in their first year of college, you might be familiar with him already, but he also was a short story writer in addition to being a novelist. And so that's what we're going to be sort of focusing on here, um, the short stories that he wrote. So before we get started, um, we've talked about some of the other literary movements um, throughout American history. And, and F. Scott Fitzgerald fits into the literary movement of modernism, which took place from 1914 to 1945. And I have some details um, in a moment for you about that time period, particularly when he's writing in the 1920s, um, because his work is really... Um, focused on showing what life was like in the 1920s and 1930s. The period before modernism was the realist period, which lasted from about 1865 to 1914. So from the American Civil War all the way until our involvement in World War I. Um, a lot of times these things are kind of broken up by wars and the impact that they have on society. Um, so... You can see some of the things here. Um, this painting we have on the left, this very experimental style. Um, the two people here in the gas masks to protect themselves from mustard gas and, um, and some of the atomic bomb that came later during World War II. So a little bit of the historical background. I think, you know, a lot of times World War II is sort of focused on more because of the impact that it had in the number of people who died, because a lot of, <laughs> just, just to be frank, um, a lot of people, there are still people who remember that war, right? For the most part, the people who remember World War I um, are no longer living mostly. And if they do, you know, even if you have, um, I think my grandmother would have been born the year that the that World War I ended, or possibly the year right after. So she's still alive, but certainly can't remember it. But at the time, it was called the Great War. Um, and here are some pictures just to sort of show what that war looked like. The Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire were against the Allied forces, Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Japan, and the U.S. joined in 1917. This was really the first time that modern technology was available. So modern warfare resulted in an unprecedented amount of carnage and destruction really never seen before on that level. And again, as I said, you know, we remember World War II many times because of the atrocities committed upon um, the Jewish people and some of the other ethnic groups in Germany, um, such as the Romani, who were also called gypsies sometimes, um, as well as people who were mentally ill and handicapped and um, also people in the LGBT community. But World War I was really the first time that you'd had a, a global um, a global conflict of that type. That's literally why they called it the World War. And this had a, a large impact um, on people and it really did affect um, literature and art and music and, and other forms of expression. More than 9 million soldiers were killed by the end of the war in November 1918, and a larger portion of the world, obviously, than now when we have more people on Earth, but um, 9, million, 9 million people throughout the world killed because of this war. So the 
Roaring Twenties, um, World War I affected people even after the war was over. A lot of soldiers suffered from shell shock, they called it. Now we'd say PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Physical problems from the war, including effects from poisonous gases. So mustard gas, tear gas, and chlorine were some of the weapons used at that time. Automobile assembly lines made cars available to everyday people. Now, this might not seem like a big deal to those of us who, you know, we've lived in this world with with cars our entire lives. But um, before, when we just had horses, you'd have to take very long rides. And um, I'm reading a book right now where um, there's this boy and his family and the uncle lives 10 miles away. And the parents take a journey basically for the whole the weekend to go and visit the uncle because it, you know, was it was a longer way to go back then. And cars also, um, this is sort of important in Fitzgerald's story, which we'll talk about in a minute, but automobiles really changed dating. That might sound odd, but before, um, before the car, you don't really have a teenage culture. You have people who are, um, they go to school for a certain period of time and then they become adults and they go to work in the factory or they go to work on the farm, right? But you don't have as much people who are teenagers. Some went to college, but not as many. So beginning in the 1920s, when cars are available, you have um, teenagers start to drive around and they're so available and they're so cheap that um, people in their teens and 20s aren't doing courting anymore, where you would meet someone and you would take a buggy ride to their house, you would sit there with them um, and their parents. And instead, what happens is that people start to go out. They actually go out on dates, right? They make an appointment or that's basically what a date is. So that is something that really... um, plays a role in in the stories by Fitzgerald. It's the Roaring Twenties because people in this age group had some freedoms that they really did not have before and a lot more um, social life than um, previously. Films start to emerge. Hollywood expands. Radio broadcasting. Some of the networks we have today, ABC, NBC, and CBS, started out as radio broadcasting services and um, the the American Broadcasting Network, the National Broadcasting Network, Columbia Broadcasting Network is named after Columbia Studios. But you can see by that national, American, a lot of people throughout the country are getting the same information at the same time. So again, a lot less in the realist um, writers, um, I talk in American literature about regionalism and the importance of regional differences. So before this, you're in Texas, you're getting the news from Texas for the most part, right? You're getting, um, you're you're reading books written by people in Texas. (laughs) You might get some from from New York here and there, but for the most part, that's it. Same thing for um, California, which was being settled uh, in the 1800s and and early 1900s. People finally... um, that whole thing of westward expansion um, flourished by that point, right? The country was sort of um, spread out the way it is now. But you had um, people in California who were different from people in Texas, who were different from people in Maine, who were different from people in Massachusetts. And now we have a little bit more of um, homogenization so that first we have the same radio shows and then we have the same television shows and um, and then we start to see chains pop up in the 1950s. So things like McDonald's, you can go to one anywhere and it's kind of the same. Later on, things like Walmart, you can go to anywhere them and they're kind of the same. So it's sort of interesting. But the important thing in child <laughs> stories, here's a, a flapper from the 1920s, a girl who likes to drink and party and dance and all of that. Women also served in the military in World War I. Um, but 
were not allowed to vote until 1920. So uh, again, if you're looking at this story, which takes place in the middle of the 20s, women suddenly have all these rights as well, and they start to be a little bit more liberated, which is going to be important in our story and in a lot of Fitzgerald's writings too. He um, had a very tumultuous relationship with his wife, but she was also the inspiration for some of his work. And in some cases, he may have stole some things from her, from her journals and from other things that she wrote. It's not quite clear on that point. We'll talk about that more later. But very strong female characters um, because of some of these changes. Prohibition um, began in 1920 and lasted until 1933. So right when women gained the right to vote, they lost the right to drink. Alcohol began being made illegally and bootlegging led to gang violence, organized crime, people dying and going blind as well. There's a great book called The Poisoner's Handbook where you can read a little bit more about what happened with bootlegging alcohol. Um, a lot of it was wormwood and, and not really drinkable. The Russian Revolution of 1917 brought the Red Scare, uprisings, and a beginning to feel um, the the fear of communism. So here, um, European anarchist with a bomb who might be uh, coming up on Lady Liberty here with a, um, a, a, a dagger maybe in his hand. Come unto me, ye oppressed, is what it says there at the bottom. That's a political cartoon from that time. We talked before, or um, I was going to say we talked before, but I think uh, that lecture is actually coming up. There's another lecture where I'll talk a little bit more about Jim Crow laws. Um, the KKK was growing to 4 million members. Um, it declined in the 1930s, but reappeared during the Civil Rights Movement. It doesn't really have too much to do with the story we're looking at, but just something to kind of know the historical background. The Harlem Renaissance was called the New Negro Cultural Movement in Literature, Art, and Music that was centered in New York City. And we have a picture there. So some of the things that are going on culturally, you know, a, a real um, large changes to the American culture from the times of the horse and buggy, especially after World War One and in this time period leading up to the Great Depression, um, where you have uh, some of these people lose a lot of their wealth and, and things like that. And we also have a problem with the Dust Bowl, the... Um, the drought in middle America. So F. Scott Fitzgerald is living during this time. He's an American writer and his works helped to demonstrate, I love this phrase here, the flamboyance and excess of the jazz age. That's one of the things that he's very concerned with in a lot of his works. In this work, it, it, it's very interesting, the short story I'm going to be talking about in a moment, but I really feel in some ways it's a celebration of the jazz age. And in other ways, it's kind of um, a little bit in fear of the changes that are coming with the jazz age. It's sort of your job to interpret that and and figure out quite what his message is. But it's it's interesting nonetheless. While he achieved popular success, fame and fortune in his lifetime, he did not receive much critical acclaim until after his death. He was one of the more famous members of the Lost Generation, which was a group of authors who came of age in World War I. And because of their experiences during the war, they were wandering, directionless, confused, and many became expatriates, meaning they left the country, still citizens, but not actually living in the United States. So some of them um, fought in the war and others were um, a little bit too young for that. You have writers like Gertrude Stein who wrote um, or who had experiences driving an ambulance <laughs> during the war, um, other people like that. In that same group, Hemingway was also in that group, again, um, lived abroad for much of, the, much of the time. Fitzgerald met and married Zelda Sayer, and the two had a competitive and tumultuous marriage. They had one and only uh, only one child. Um, Zelda was in and out of mental institutions. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and she was put in a sanitarium. Now, the thing that you need to know is that at this point, um, even though women had the right to vote, their rights were still limited in some ways. So it is possible um, and, and there are... 
clear indications that she did have a mental illness, but there are also clear indications, possibly, that I should say not clear indications. There are some indications that F. Scott Fitzgerald um, didn't maybe feel like he could divorce her and and possibly saw this as kind of a way out. It's not really clear. What we do know, there she is, um, she wanted to be a ballerina long after she would have really been physically able to, um, and that's them with their child. So Fitzgerald was a modernist writer, and the modernist focused on breaking with the past traditions, um, again, partially because of those issues that came up in World War II, they sort of saw, or World War I. So they saw some of the traditions of the past as leading to this horrifying destruction. And in some ways, they wanted to celebrate advances in science and the freedom of, uh, you know, <laughs> partying and drinking and, and some of those things that had to do with the, the flapper um, mentality and the flapper lifestyle. But in other ways, they really were um, uh, afraid of some of the destruction that had happened and possibly that it would happen again, which of course it did, right? So um, he's writing in a time of great prosperity, but also with um, some fear and trepidation about the things of the past and possibly the things to come. Fitzgerald finished four novels. Um, that's a little bit of a alliteration there for you. This Side of Paradise, The Beautiful and the Damned, The Great Gatsby, and Tender as the Night. He also wrote several movie scripts. He moved to Hollywood later in life. He felt like that was kind of compromising his art, but you do what you need to do for money. And then he published over 160 short stories, one of which we will be taking a look at. He died of a heart attack complicated by alcoholism at the age of 44. That's why the beginning slide, I only have two pictures of him because he did not really live as long as some of the other authors that we're looking at. You know, the thing here really about his death and uh, about their lifestyle too, um, I'll zoom in on this picture here so you at least have something interesting while I talk. Um, really, it's kind of clear that he suffered from mental illness too, um, anxiety and depression and things like that. And really, a lot of their drinking was self-medicating. Some of it was kind of living it up, you know, and, and, you know, again, part of that flapper lifestyle and the joy of the jazz age. But I think when you read his work, you can really, whoops, sorry, guys. Um, when you read his work, you can really see both the glittery side of the jazz age and also the dark underbelly. And that's kind of clear in, you know, the book, The Great Gatsby, which I said, I know, um, I love all of his books, actually, but The Great Gatsby, I do think is a wonderful work of literature. And you see this person who is throwing these lavish parties, right? Um, and Gatsby, and he's a hero that everybody admires, but he's made money um, through bootlegging. He's has ties to the mob and, uh, and also is engaged in an adulterous affair. So there are all of these kind of aspects and it's not just one thing. And like many stories of success, they often come at a price. So the story that we're going to be looking at from F. Scott Fitzgerald is a little bit of a lighter one, which will be nice compared to some of the other things that we've been reading. And it's called Bernice Bob's Her Hair. Now, if you are uh, using the literature book that I assigned and you're interested in reading more, there's a great... Um, there's a great story by him also called A Diamond as Big as the Ritz. I'm, if, if, depending on what semester you're looking at this in, I might also assign that. But um, if I haven't assigned it, I highly recommend that you read it. It's a really um, interesting story about um, a man who finds the world's largest diamond and then what happens after that. So this is a picture. Um, this is a uh, woman is named Dora Sutherland. The Sutherland sisters are actually the subject of one of the novels that I published um, <laughs> called Sutherland. <laughs> and uh, she had hair that was about seven feet long. You can see it kind of goes out of the picture and she's sitting on a swing there. Um, her, she and her sisters were really known for their very long hair. And in the time period before the 1920s um, in America, but also very much in Europe during the Victorian times, before World War I and in the early 
to mid and a little bit of the late 1800s, long hair was extremely desirable. So Dora was a famous um, singer with her six sisters. There were seven of them total. And she um, was also in the circus um, as an act. They were in the circus as an act that would perform and they had hair care products as well. Um, the reason that I show you her picture is just to show you, you know, how desirable this was. People collected, this is a, a card, kind of like baseball cards. Um, some of the performers in the circus would have these and people would collect them because their hair was so desirable. This is a picture of a silent film star from the 1920s who very famously cut her long hair. And um, around that time, around 1920, women, because they were now liberated and had the vote and they were able to also um, wear clothing that was a little bit more revealing and have short dresses instead of long Victorian ones like the one Dora's wearing with a high collar, right? You can see a little bit here. She's got a sleeveless dress on. Um, can't see too much of it because of how she's turned, but um, uh, you know, that traditional flapper dress you may have seen before. So the reason that this is important is because the setting of the story takes place during this time, and Bernice is uh, deciding whether or not to bob her hair. Should she get rid of it? What are the social implications? So the story concerns Bernice, a wealthy girl from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and she goes to visit her cousin Marjorie for the month of August. Bernice overhears a conversation between Marjorie and her aunt, who's Marjorie's mother, in which Marjorie complains that Bernice is socially hopeless. <coughs> doesn't want to hang out with her. She's embarrassing. The next morning, Bernice threatens to leave town and Marjorie basically gives her a makeover, teaching her how to have conversations, how to flirt, how to dance and all of that. Her best line is teasing the boys with the idea that she'll bob her hair and they'll get to watch. The new Bernice is a big hit with the boys in town and her with her new attitude, especially with Warren, a boy who Marjorie keeps around as her own, but sometimes neglects because she's having too much fun. And when it becomes uh, apparent that Warren is interested in Bernice, Marjorie tricks her into bobbing her hair. And then she's a liberated woman, but she has to deal with everyone's reactions. So again, I wanted you to have kind of the basic overview of the story so that you can think more about the analysis and what things mean. I really think that this is um, a fun story that has very interesting social implications. And the reason I gave you guys so much historical background here, as opposed to some of the other lectures where I talk a lot more about the techniques the writers are using, um, here modernists are concerned with the breakdown of social institutions, pushing boundaries, um, doing things in new and experimental ways. This story is not really written in an experimental way, but um, it certainly has um, a, a more... Um, some of the characters uh, represent that kind of that kind of life. So things to consider as you read Bernice Bob's her hair. We have another picture of a girl with bobbed hair um, playing golf, which was kind of the the faddish sport at the time. Satire we have not talked about too often, but satire occurs when an author uses humor, irony, exaggeration, hyperbole, we did talk about before, and ridicule to expose and criticize people, politics, or society as on a whole. So to what extent is this story a satire? And how is he trying to criticize American society or American values? And in what ways is he trying to celebrate those values? To be honest, I think you can see kind of both here. But there is a this is a story about this generational divide. And to me, one of the reasons I like it is because this is so classic, right? Every generation has, um, oh, I can't believe the old institutions and the old way of thinking was this. And I can't believe this new fangled way of thinking is this. Every generation goes through that. So it's really apparent in this story. The role of women is changing. Fitzgerald, as I said, had a tense relationship with strong women in his life. So think about the female characters in this story. We have Marjorie, we have her mother, we have Bernice. And these are 
I think in their own ways, each kind of trying to exert power, which also is a lot of the conflict. The conflict is is definitely um, woman versus woman, I guess, or man versus man, if you want to kind of put it in traditional terms. But also the conflict in some ways is woman versus society. So kind of look for that. To what extent do they have power and agency? And to what extent are they still kind of held back and not getting full equal treatment? Look for actions, clothing styles, and clothing choices and hairstyles that are symbolic. Um, you know, the bombing of the hair is the most obvious one, but there's description of other things too. So some of the flapper culture is emerging in this story. What represents the old way and what represents the new way? And consider whether the story has a happy ending. I didn't give away the ending and the overview, but I really want you to think about... Um, Typically, a comedy occurs when the protagonist reaches his or her goals. Um, does the protagonist reach her goals in the end? What sacrifices are needed to reach these goals? Or does the protagonist really fail to reach their goal in the end? Do they have some kind of a downfall? Or is it somewhere in between? I think that that's kind of an interesting question to go into Um as you read this story. So I believe that, yep, <laughs> that is it for today. And um, after the short story section is finished up, um, here we'll be moving on to a little bit of uh, either longer works or um, drama. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts about Bernice Bob's her hair. <laughs>